In Pit Lane is proudly brought to you by Dino Tech by Dino Dynamics. For your nearest workshop, visit our website. And with the support of the Ramada Resort, Phillip Island. Welcome back to In Pit Lane. Well, as I said, if you look at the, the results at Bathurst last weekend, it was literally a roll call of people who have competed at some stage in the Victorian State Formula Ford Championship. Obviously, people like Chaz Mostert, uh, Jamie Wincup, uh, uh, um, pretty much everybody, James Moffat, I've, I've, I've lost, lost track of everyone at the moment, Taz Douglas, all those guys started off at some stage in the Victorian State Championship. It really is probably the success story, the road to uh, success in Formula in uh, V8 supercars. Joining us tonight is the winner of the 2014 Victorian Formula Ford Championship. He is Adrian Lazaro. Adrian, welcome to Winpit Lane. Uh, thank you very much. So, did you watch Bathurst on the weekend, first of all, and what did you, what did you think of it? Yeah, I watched Bathurst. It was a last 20 laps was pretty crazy with uh, Jamie Wincote running out of fuel and just everything that all the leaders just got tied up with everything and it was just a bit crazy. What do you think of the decision? There's been a lot of criticism and a lot of discussion both ways about Jamie Wincup's decision to ignore the calls to, to save fuel. Roland Dane went ballistic and apparently said, well, you, know, you, you cost us any chance of that race. You cost us valuable points. You were very selfish. Put, you're in that position. Bathurst, the biggest race of your life, half a lap to go and they're saying slow down. Are you going to slow down? Um, well, instinct, you wouldn't slow down, but um, in the long run, I think you could have slowed down and saved a, conserved a bit of fuel and um, could have paid off in the long run, but it could have gone either way. I think that's one of the problems of having the of having Bathurst now as a round of the championship because you've got to look at that big picture now. Certainly in the old days, it would have been sort of, you know, you know, glory or nothing, now you've got to take into account the fact that you are, it is a round of a championship and you've, you've got to look at that big picture and he really has cost himself a lot of points. Thankfully he's probably in a position where it hasn't hurt him too badly but uh, it, it, it could have cost him a championship. Yeah exactly, like it's um, double points I'm pretty sure for the round and um, he, yeah, he hasn't got a massive lead compared to um, Frosty at the moment so it could have hurt him real bad. Like I said, as I was sort of putting together the report of the of Bathurst the other the other night, I looked at all of those names and thought, hang on, all of these people, they've been competitors in the Victorian Formula Ford Championship. As I said, Chas Mostert did race a, race a few races here. We had Will Davison, James Moffat, Taz Douglas, Nick Perkat. You can go right through the top ten, and pretty much most of the cars had at least one driver who was at, spent, at least spent some time in the Victorian State Championship. Does that, uh, does that give you any sort of uh, confidence in going for, forward in your career? Yeah, it does. Like, um, Formula Ford's a great stepping stone for um, V8 supercars, and um, like it would be great to even have a go in a V8 supercar one day. Is that your your ambition now? Is are you focused on V8 supercars, or are you still holding out that you might even go overseas at some stage and try and get a career overseas? Um, I yeah, I wouldn't mind going over to America or running V8 supercars. They're uh, very, both very great series and. You could go, yeah, either way with them. So tell us about your uh, your Formula Ford series locally this year. I mean, as we reported a couple of weeks ago, um, you didn't win the final round. You, you sort of just did enough to, to get over the line and, and win the championship. Was that a conscious decision? Was that something where you said, well, I've, this is what I've got to do to win the championship and I don't need to do anything else? Or was that just the way it happened to fall into place? Yeah, well, uh, last race didn't really, yeah, it didn't really, wasn't our way. Um, we... Yeah, the car got a bit mushy towards the end, so I had a little bit of an off, and um, yeah, everything I seemed to do, like, kind of come back to bite us, and uh, a couple cars passed me here and there, and like, yeah, I would have loved to be at the front, but yeah, it just didn't happen. 
Thomas Randall, of course, took part in that, came from the national series and just you know, blew everyone away. Does, does that sort of give you some pause you know, for you guys in the state series when you see somebody from the national series coming back and just being so dominant on, on, in those situations? Yeah, Tom, he did drive very well all weekend. And um, he d he's in the car a lot, which has benefited him. And, like, he, yeah, he did race very well all weekend and he was untouchable. So what are your plans for next year? Are you going heading to the National Series? Yeah, we would love to run the National Series next year. We'll, um, we'll try and put it together. And, yeah, so we'll hopefully be on the grid next year. So when you say hopefully on the grid, that means that obviously you're still trying, you're look, still looking for some money along the along the way to make this happen. What sort of what sort of funds are you looking to do it? I mean, we, we've heard in the last few weeks we've talked about Formula Four and we've heard all sorts of figures about how much it costs to do a national series. How much do you think realistically doing it from you know just the way you ran the state series, doing a lot of the work yourself? How much can you get away with with running a national series next year? Um, yeah, so we did do the states is for very, very cheap, like for like it was what we could afford, and um, like it was, and we'll hopefully try and do the national series like the same, but obviously it's going to be a bit more with entry, and hopefully we'll do a bit more testing. Um, maybe I'm not really sure what price you could put on it, but um, yeah, so we'll just see what we can get a budget together and see what we can do. So where does that money come from? I mean, in terms of, we've heard sort of stories of, of budgets as high as $200,000 plus. Now, that was when the cars were with the VA supercars. They've cut a lot of those costs now, but we're still talking well over $100,000. For, for the average person, the average guy like yourself, where do you possibly find that sort of money? Um, yeah, we do get a bit of money off our sponsors, like our main sponsor, like Melbcon and Parkinson Group. And like, they help us out quite a bit. And, but we do fund it a bit ourselves as well. What about Formula 4? Have you looked into that at all? Because there's a, certainly CAMS are very keen to see it become a success. It's running on the V8 supercar card. Um, is that something that you've looked at at all? And do you think that's a, a, it's a viable alternative to Formula 4? Or is that just a step beyond already? Um, oh, personally, we haven't looked at Formula 4. But I think Formula 4 is always a great stepping stone for Formula 4. And it's just, yeah, so like just getting your car skills and everything up in Formula Ford will help benefit you in Formula Ford, really. The argument that a lot of people have used over the years regarding Formula Ford, and, and Eugene Rocker, when he was on the program a few weeks ago, said that guys coming out of carts were saying that when they stepped into Formula Ford, they found them a little bit pedestrian after their, their time in top-level sprint karting. What did you find? I mean, have you found that? Were they, was it a bit of a shock in terms of, in terms of that uh, transition? Um, yeah, it was, it was much different compared to go-karting, uh, like, like just speed, you've got your gears, um, you like a lot open, more track, the track's more open, um, and you, like most of the competitors in the Durotech class are a bit more younger, um, like they're not as gentleman-like compared to the Kent series, and yeah, the, the racing's good, but it's a it's different racecraft compared to a go-kart. Well, we'll find out more about your, uh, your future plans uh, when we return. We're just going to take a break now on In Pit Lane. But um, Adrian, stay there. We'll be back in just a moment. And you stay there where you are. As we said, when we come back, more with Adrian Lazaro. And also, as we said earlier, we're going to take you to Como Gardens and an amazing collection of the most beautiful cars you've seen everywhere. And some very nice gardens too. So if you're into gardening and motorsport, geez, we've got you covered. You're watching In Pit Lane. We'll be right back after this. Welcome back to In Pit Lane. Now, once again, at the conclusion of this program, if you'd like to keep the conversation going, we have our Google Hangout, In Pit Lane, the victory lap. Had it last week with Andrew Sill, Mike Jacobson joined us, Rob James and a few others. Perhaps you can join us this week if you'd like to join us. All you've got to do is join our Google Plus page. Go to Google Plus and find the In Pit Lane page. I don't know how you do that. It's Google Plus is a world unto its, into itself, but... If you head there tonight at 10.30, we'll be talking about Bathurst, we'll be talking about Fuji, Sochi, all sorts of things, as will amaze you. Now, um, as we've got our, our guest tonight is Adrian Lazaro, Victorian Formula Ford champion. How does that roll off the tongue? I mean, it, how important is it in the, in the grand scheme of things to be able to say you're the CAMS Victorian Formula Ford champion? 
Yeah, it's uh, something new over the last past two weeks, and I think it's going to help me next year in um, hopefully if we can run a national series, and it will yeah, it'll benefit us, I'm pretty sure. So, of course, you mentioned the Kent engine cars before. There's some talk about sort of slowly, perhaps regressing Formula Ford back to being an historic class, running the Kent engines, which they've done in England to an extent now. Speaking of classic cars, this is a wonderful segue, but are you someone, being a young guy, are you someone who um, really loves to look at those sort of old classic cars? You know, do you, are you interested in things like the Sandown Historic coming up soon and those older sort of you know part of motorsport history? Yeah, I, I, I do love the classy cars and um, I've always loved watching like the old Brocky days and having a look at that and um, a lot different racing craft compared to what it is nowadays. And yeah. Well, I tell you what, if you want to see some classic cars, of, of both race cars and a lot of road cars, you've got a very rare opportunity. A couple of weeks ago, we had the opportunity to go up to a place called Como Gardens. And as we said in the news, this weekend is one of the twice yearly open days. Now, normally you can't get in to see this collection of cars, but it's not just the cars, it's also an amazing garden setting as well. Look, it's one of these things, take the family... Everybody's going to love this, but just to give you a tiny little preview of what you're going to see this weekend, as I said a couple of weeks ago, we went to Como Gardens and, well, take a look at this. Nestled in the foothills of the Dandenong Ranges, Less than an hour away from the noise and chaos of the Melbourne CBD is a little slice of paradise called Como Gardens. Now, uh, this particular area of six, uh, six acres that we're, that we're fronting here now was, uh, was set up in 1976 by uh, John Chandler and uh, he set the whole thing up uh, displaying all the trees and shrubs that, uh, that he had, uh, uh, that he was actually sowing and they had it all nicely labelled, uh, set up like uh, um, uh, the botanical gardens. We um, uh, had an opportunity to set up a, a, a trail, um, a train track of uh, 650 metres and uh, I uh, had an acquaintance uh, uh, in the area who was a, a very well um, informed gentleman and uh, he was uh, responsible for building two trains for me. One is a steam, a steam train and a uh, coal-fired uh, arrangement and uh, a very, very powerful thing. He told me that the, the, um, that steam train was, uh, had sufficient power to, to pull about seven or eight tonne. And he also built a, a second engine, which, which is a diesel design, but it's actually uh, um, hydraulic and uh, powered by a Datsun 1200. But we're not here for the gardens, beautiful as they are, nor even for the trains. We're here for the treasure trove locked away behind closed doors and rarely seen by the public. A collection of some of the rarest and most beautiful examples of automotive art ever assembled in Australia. Well, our first uh, um, car was a uh, uh, 1914 Fiat Roadster. Um, and um, we had a lot of fun with this car. We did a ground up restoration on it. And um, uh, we got involved in the early car movement and um, um, I was absolutely intrigued. I said to my wife at that stage, can you believe that uh, some of these people actually own more than one old car? I mean, how can they justify that? And um, well, the, the <laughs> That's uh, really history now because uh, we, we um, really finished up being attracted to various types of cars and, um, and um, I'm asked at this point, uh, um, are you going to buy more old cars? And I'm saying, I'm not saying yes, I'm not saying no. The 540K Mercedes Benz uh, really a handcrafted car because uh, uh, they, were, they uh, commenced production on this between 36 and 39 and we're only talking about 410 cars. They came out in various forms. Um, I've got, uh, uh, the car that I've got is a, a Cabriolet C and um, it's a very, very desirable and very, very collectible car. Um, these, uh, these cars were uh, f uh, highly favoured by the Hollywood jet setters 
Adolf Hitler actually gifted uh, some of these cars to uh, global leaders. So we know that he uh, gifted one to Joseph Stalin when they was, that was what, when they were still friends. Um, the uh, customs people provided uh, evidence, which I've got, that the car was actually third right. Um, it was on loan uh, apparently to uh, uh, Professor Ernst Heinkel from 36 to 39. Now, Heinkel was a chap who designed and built the, um, uh, the Heinkel bomber that caused much devastation in both Europe, uh, England and Europe during World War II. Um, I'm very fortunate to have uh, uh, the only uh, Type 35C Bugatti in Australia. Uh, Tory Bugatti, the, the manufacturer, he, um, uh, he was responsible for uh, building, well, he only built a few hundred cars anyway, but uh, uh, to right to this very day, the Bugatti is still the most successful motor car ever built. And, uh, and openly lauded as being the most beautiful car, most beautiful uh, Grand Prix car, right to this very day, and I don't think anybody would question that either. More power, better fuel economy, a cleaner, more efficient engine. They're just a few of the advantages of having your car tuned on a Dynotech Dyno. To find your nearest Dynotech workshop, go to dyno.com.au. Dynotech by Dyno Dynamics. <laughs>